Welcome back to our second panel discussion this afternoon. Um, we were given a, a very good account of the founding story of Yale and US, as it were. So now we would like to sort of broaden the discussion further and look at experiences of other universities, other institutes in uh, liberal arts education. And we're delighted to have three university and college leaders who will speak of their respective approaches to meeting the challenges of internationalization and how in the process they also have to manage uh, talents in terms of tenure process and also the challenges of access to liberal arts education in the US. So we've got three distinguished speakers. What I intend to do is to introduce them um, and invite them to speak. They'll each speak for about 15 minutes and we'll hear from all three speakers before we open the floor for a dis general discussion. So uh, let me invite our first speaker. He is Professor Andrew Hamilton, Vice Chancellor of Oxford University. Professor Hamilton has served as Vice Chancellor of Oxford since October 2009. Prior to that, he was Provost at Yale University from 2004 to 2008. Professor Hamilton has won international acclaim for his work on organic and biological chemistry and has won several prestigious awards for his research. He's a Fellow of the Royal Society and the American Association of Arts and Sciences. Professor Hamilton will take up the position of President of New York University on 1st January 2016. So Prof. Hamilton will offer a perspective of international liberal education from Oxford and NYU, where he's now on transit. <laughs> thank you very much indeed, and, and thank you for that uh, uh, introduction. And ladies and gentlemen, I fear that this is the last time that I will be addressing you in this way. Uh, because from January the 1st, I intend to adopt a broad Brooklyn accent. And, uh, <laughs> and, 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 and may I just join all, all, of, our, all of our speakers uh, over, the, uh, over the day in, in just saying how delighted I am to be here, to be celebrating with all of you this very, very special event, the founding of the Yale NUS College. And, and let me, as I do for the next three months, representing Oxford, bring greetings to Pericles, to all of his colleagues at Yale NUS. I bring greetings from one of the oldest institutions of higher education in the world, to one of the youngest, and we wish, you, we wish you very good fortune. And I think all of us have enjoyed enormously over the day the discussion, particularly among the founding presidents, of, of, of the curriculum and how the thinking going into this new college will really redefine liberal education for the 21st century, particularly in an Asian context. For me, it's particularly interesting because what we have heard about, what we are seeing in front of our eyes, is really the, the development of an American-style model, or at least an American-influenced model, in a country, Singapore, that has been strongly historically affected by its British connections. And of course, as Cho Chuan said in his words, that the higher education system in Singapore had a strong British flavor to it. And in, in listening to the, the conversation this morning and, and, and then this afternoon, I decided I'd actually change what I was going to say and I, I've thrown away my prepared speech. And I wanted really just to, to talk a little bit, I'm the only representative from the UK, and I think it's very important for me and for all of us to understand the nature of that UK structured educational system and why it evolved in the way that it has, why it is structured in the way that it has. I suppose in a sense, we, we heard from Cho Chuan, from Pericles and from Rick, the, their thoughts upon how this structure and this curriculum will evolve. And I hope that as that evolution occurs, considerable thought and, and, and remembrance, in a sense, will be given to the, to the cultural, the historical links to the UK and why 
in places like Oxford and Cambridge, there is still a very strong commitment to a very particular type of education. And for me, it, it is fascinating. Many of you know my career. You heard it uh, in the introduction. I've bounced across the Atlantic several times in my career, and I'm about to bounce back again. And, and of course, what we find in the UK and in the United States, despite, as George Bernard Shaw said, being separated by a common language, despite speaking a common language, these two countries have created, in a sense, profoundly different forms of undergraduate education. And it's that that I just want to touch upon briefly in my words. And I now find myself in, in Oxford, which, as I said a moment ago, is one of the oldest universities in the world. It's nearly 900 years old. And there are many, many disadvantages of being the vice chancellor of a very old institution. It won't surprise you. It has rather peculiar ways of going about business. It has a very bizarre governance structure that I won't even begin to describe. But there are some advantages of being the vice chancellor of a very ancient institution. We've heard a lot about globalization today, and I like to point out to all of my North American colleagues that Oxford took its first international student in the year 1190. And <laughs> we, we actually know, we know who his name was. He was Emo of Friesland. He, he, I must confess he sounds a little bit like a Sesame Street character, but, <laughs> but he is actually a real person who we know came it also, that long perspective allows us to, to look at crises and to manage and, and, and put crises into proportion. Rick talked about the crisis that we've all felt. I may have escaped it at Yale, but I walked straight into the economic crisis in, in, of 2008 in Oxford. But it does allow us, I, again, uh, as a vice chancellor of a 900-year-old university, I do like to point out to my colleagues that while this is a crisis, if you want a real crisis, the bubonic plague, that <laughs> was a real crisis. And I, I think it also, to be more serious, it allows us to take a long view over very exciting new initiatives. Rick talked about Coursera and the impact that it's having. The, the digital revolution of information is, is affecting all of us and how we go about our, our teaching and research. But again, you know, at, at, at Oxford, I can also point out that we were 300 years old when the previous information revolution took place. It was called the printing press. And it was significant, and we all absorbed it. It was very bad for a certain cohort of academics, particularly <laughs> the scribes who by hand copied manuscripts. But on the other hand, it was absorbed and it was incorporated into the way teaching and scholarship took place, as of course we see the digital evolution, the digital revolution very much in the same way. So that long perspective on, on education, I think also can be seen in the very different structure that we have in the United Kingdom. And I'll talk a little bit about Oxford uh, in, in specifics. And we've heard several times today reference made to the very narrowness of, of, of European education, the very narrowness of, of, of degree structures. And of course, in, in a place like Oxford, that's something we take great pride in. In fact, we feel very strongly that there is much educational benefit. I'll come on to this right at the end in a more provocative way, but there's very, there's educational benefit in taking a subject, a single subject, and diving into that subject with the depth and the intensity that real focus during three years of undergraduate study allows. And that, that with, in Oxford, with one or two very famous exceptions, and PPE being, being the perfect example. But nonetheless, it is that focus that really becomes the fundamental underpinning of, of, of the educational philosophy of the institution. And it's, I, it's also 
for me, quite important to point out as we look at the benefits, the advantages of different styles of teaching and education, that as we heard from Chor Chuan Tan and Professor Richard Levin, it's also important to point out that both of them are graduates of Oxford University and so <laughs> have benefited from this form of education. And of course, a fundamental element, and again, this is something that is already being embraced at Yale and US, a fundamental element is very personalized teaching. In Oxford, of course, it's called the tutorial system. And it's worthwhile just, just resting a few moments and, and, and thinking about what it is about that form of teaching that makes it so distinctive and why it has great value. And again, those of you who aren't familiar with it, an Oxford undergraduate will have at least once a week, and in some courses twice a week, one-on-one -on -one or one-on-two hour, an hour-long one-on-one, one-on-two meeting with their tutor, usually a, a, a leading scholar in their field. And in that time, they will be challenged, they will debate, they will discuss, but most importantly, they will be in the focus and the gaze of their tutor. In an Oxford tutorial, there is absolutely nowhere to hide for the student. And that has a fundamental consequence in the nature of the education, because it means that the student, while they are in that tutorial for an hour, just as important is the 15 hours of preparation, possibly 20, 25 hours of preparation that they have carried out before the tutorial, where they have delved into the subject. They've explored different areas of, of intellectual perspective on a given topic. They have developed those, those traits of what everyone in this room would agree are vital in a higher education, which is self-motivation and self-discipline and self-study. And so in a sense, the tutorial-based teaching really does give a, a, a focal point to the nature of, of that form of education. And again, as NUS, Yale NUS College evolves, I know that great attention will be given to the very personal oversight that will take place in the intellectual development of individual students. It is a glory to behold as one sees a f an 18-year-old Oxford undergraduate absolutely fearful and intimidated by the prospect of an hour's tutorial one-on-one -on -one with, a, with a scholar. And by the time they graduate, they're arguing with their tutor, they're expressing themselves forcefully. They are developing, and critically, they are developing intellectual self-confidence. And that's a vital part of the output. I want to very briefly, just, just I, I will read very quickly from what I think is the best description of this, time of this type of education. It was written by an American student who graduated from Oxford about four years ago. His name's Evan Burfield. He wrote this on a blog post on the Huffington Post. And again, it, it sums up to me something that is, it, that is critical in this approach. And I, I quote, Oxford was an intellectual re revelation. There were no classes. Lectures were, were more of a suggestion than a requirement. Each week for three years, I would receive a paradoxical question and a list of books longer than I could read in a month. Then seven days later, I would show up for a one-on-one -on -one meeting with my tutor with a 2,000-word essay in answer to the question. My tutor would challenge my argument. He actually uses much more colorful language, so I paraphrase. My, the tutor would challenge my argument and then send me off with another question and another set of books. And here's a key point, and, and this is underpinning everything. At Oxford, my tutors were upfront about the fact that they considered it irrelevant what facts I knew when I left. Rather, their job was to teach to teach me how to learn rapidly, to think critically, and to communicate effectively, and then leave me to spend the rest of my life 
filling my head with knowledge. And I think, again, that reinforces what we've heard so much this morning about the importance of liberal education in developing mechanisms of thinking, the quality of mind that then results. And his last point, the irony of Oxford, is that by spending less time in the classroom with less examination, and I won't dwell on that, but can do in questions, with less time in the classroom, less examining, I rounded out the skills necessary to excel in the emerging economy. And so I think as we take these things, I'd like to just leave three provocative points that we can perhaps come back to in discussion. Number one, that while this system, many would view it as anachronistic, even archaic, of students uh, discussing and debating with tutors in their college, a key part, of course, of the structure is the college-based system, which we've heard so much about. It is archaic, it is anachronistic, but it's actually very forward-looking. And I would put it to you that it's an early example of the flipped classroom that we hear so much about from the proponents of digital education. That's, ish, that's provocative point number one. Number two, the very nature of self-study and exploration involved blurs the lines between education, teaching, and research, because the student is inherently explore, exploring areas of a subject on their own, exploring areas of, of a subject that may be unappreciated in the particular uh, perspective that the student is taking. And now my third last point, and perhaps my most provocative point, is that in this form of an education, it doesn't actually matter what subject you study. The subject is largely irrelevant. It becomes a vehicle for the training of the mind. And it's one of the reasons, of course, that in Oxford, you will still find a very large classics department and you only have to look at someone like Boris Johnson, many of you know, mayor of London, one of the most technologically sophisticated cities in the world, has a degree from Oxford in classics. Let me finish because we have, we were asked a question by Pericles a few minutes ago as how do we get the fundamental reasons why we do what we do across to policymakers and that's no easier in the UK than it is in Singapore or in the US. The only advantage we have at Oxford is that when we do talk to the Prime Minister and the government ministers, we can point out that all of them are graduates of this system. <laughs> and so while they might argue, as they do for a much more utilitarian approach, in fact, it is there development and their success that is based on these sorts of structures. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Hamilton, for um, of contextualize, contextualizing the challenges of education over the long durée, for reminding us of the merit or reminding us of the merits of the deep dive in a single subject and of course also arguing that the tutorial system, far from being an archaic system, is actually quite forward-looking. Now I'm going to invite our second speaker, Professor Chang Jie, President of Shanghai Chao Tong University. Professor Chang has served as President of Shanghai Chao Tong since 2006. He is a renowned and award-winning scientist specializing in laser plasma and high-field physics. Uh, Professor Chang is an academician of the Chinese Academy of Sciences, member of the German Academy of Sciences, Leopoldina, foreign member of the Royal uh, Member of Engineering and Fellow of the Third World Academy of Sciences. Under his leadership, Shanghai Jiao Tong has made great strides and is now a world-class university. It's my pleasure now to invite Professor Chang to deliver his address. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. So it is uh, always a difficult job after Andrew's talk. So as uh, Andrew mentioned, there are quite a few uh, Oxford alumnus. So actually, I also had my research training in Oxford for eight years. 
So probably I also had uh, got a very strong influence of Oxford in my lifetime. So the story I'm going to share with you this afternoon is uh, a Chinese university, how to transfer this university into a world-class university. And the job has not yet been done, but uh, I would like to share with you at the moment is the transition to a tenure system. So the mission of Chinese universities at the present time is uh, very critical because China as a whole is in transition. Because in last uh, 35 years, Chinese economy developed very, very fast, but mainly by cheap labor, by very cheap resources. So in order to get a sustainable development for future China, we have to make China to trend make China into the transition of the driving force to innovation. So therefore, Chinese universities has the responsibility to play the role as the engine of innovation for China. So the fundamental of the value of the university lies in innovation by definition at the present stage. So the society, the relationship between society and the university can, well, summarize as the major three folds. Firstly, the university have to provide innovative talents to the development of society. And secondly, the university have to provide innovation for science and technology. And thirdly, especially for Chinese universities, is the, it is our responsibility to provide innovative culture to make influ influence for the future of Chinese culture. So therefore, under that understanding, in 2007, after a major strategic planning of the university, we decided we have to set up our goal for 2020 as uh, three to build three systems. Firstly, is a system for talent development, and the secondly, is the system for innovative capacity, and the thirdly, is the university culture. The difference between a good university and a bad university maybe is whether the university can be the can be excellence in those three systems. So that is our goal we set up in 2007. So bearing in mind of those three objectives, the major transformation we had to do from 2007 to 2020 is the transition in developing mode and also transition of managing mode and also the transition of motivating the, the faculty members and also motivating the schools. The main strategy for Shanghai Jiao University is to take these institutional incentives. So that's uh, our decision we made in 2007, which is called the 3 plus 3 plus 1, equals to innovative university with an intrinsic motivation for innovation. So that was our strategic decision in 2007. Of course, to realize that uh, objectives, the key is to build a high quality faculty team. So the university, by definition, is a long-term, very complicated system. So therefore, the faculty is the main body to stimulate or to motivate. So therefore, you need a systematic and con con continuous uh, motivation, which is institutional incentive. In order to build a world-class faculty team, especially for Chinese universities, we have a very serious challenge because if 
you are a new university, you can just hire the world-class faculty team. But the reality is, in 2007, we already have a very large existing faculty team. They are basically lifetime appointment with a very, well, with a relatively low academic uh, expectation. And of course, the salary was also very low. So therefore, we decided we have to make this transition in three steps. First step, we have to build a high quality and also high standard, high academic standard by hire, hiring high, well, talents globally. And the second step, we have to make a major reform for our existing faculty teams. And then later on, we have to merge those two teams together. So that's what we have done in last eight years. So step, first step is we have to recruit the high talent, uh, well, from world-class universities. If you only hire those high talent with the well, relatively high salary and a very generous startup, they will face serious problems because the existing faculty team will think, well, everything they got is very special. So therefore, we can ask them to do anything impossible. So therefore, an extra job we asked this, well, recruited talents to do is to mentor the young, junior faculty teams in our university. So therefore, we set up special funds to provide a higher salary because we can't use our, uh, well, use the national uh, funds to support the higher salary because that will introduce uh, unfairness to the existing faculty teams. So therefore, we have to, well, uh, get uh, philanthropy to support the extra salary. And also, we have to create special uh, positions, academic, academic positions, which actually is the tenure system for the future. And also, these uh, scholars defines new standard, new academic standard for the future, future faculty team and also they mentor the junior faculty teams of the university. So that's set up some foundations for the future faculty teams. And also, the, we also hired quite a few assistant professors from the Western universities. They are already, since 2008, they are already in the uh, faculty, well, in the tenure track system with the six years tenure clock. Whereas, uh, on the other hand, we have to give very strong impression to the existing junior faculty teams. So eventually, they also have to, by selection, they have to go into the faculty, into the tenure track system. So in last eight years, we also attracted some special fund to support about 1,002 1,200 junior faculty teams, which not only upgraded their academic uh, ability, but also changed their mindset. The faculty, the introduced faculty team we set up for the future, well, development steps by fitting the gaps of the national talents so the development, development. So the first batch of a foundation we set up is, uh, well, at the beginning we thought is uh, quite many, but uh, since uh, the higher, the higher of, the, of the talents speed is much, much faster than what we thought. So therefore, by 2009, more or less, we almost used up all of our all of our donated fund. So very fortunately, by that time in 2009, we got a generous support from
from support from the, from the country. So they set up that 1,000 talent plan, and also they set up the junior 1,000 plan, which gave us sustainable development. Step step two. So by 2010, when we already got about 250, uh, well, new hires. And then those two groups started to have some kind of confliction. So then we realized by that time we have to make a, a major reform for our existing faculty of 3,000 by different, by different 18 career path for existing faculty. So we provide their choices. Either they can choose teaching only or research only or plus teaching plus research. So at the beginning, everyone thought the, well, the teaching plus research, obviously it's the future tenure sort of position. So everyone will make the first choice as research and uh, teaching. But the evaluation methodology for those posts is much more difficult. And then after one or two years, they will make the set their second choice or third choice. And eventually, some of the uh, faculty members will, will, well, will fit into the different requirement. The objective of this reform is to change the mindset of the existing faculty for, for the contract system. So by 2010, we stopped that uh, lifetime in employment, because uh, we also made a promise in the future we will change of existing faculty members, well, some of them will into the tenure system, but uh, not the lifetime appointment uh, with a very low salary. And then starting from 2010, we started this uh, large scale reform for whole university. So basically, we have to implement this uh, reform for 3,000 faculty members and also 21 schools and the departments. And also we have to change uh, salary scales and also we have to change the evaluation methodology. Well, that's uh, the, the career path we set up for the local faculty. And also after a few years, the average if they make the correct choice, the average salary was greatly increased. So then at the beginning, starting from 2010 to 2013, it was quite difficult. But after 2014, when everyone sees the, well, the benefit of this reform, uh, well, the situation becomes much, much better. And also that uh, change of the income is also very good preparation for the, for the tenure system because uh, the tenure system pays a much higher salary, whereas uh, the reform for the existing fac faculty, we planned after eight years, their salary level, if they make the correct choice, their salary level will be close to the faculty team. So that's the core part of the reform. So basically, this reform consists of four parts. The first part is the orientation of the school it has to be exactly the same as the, as the aim of the university. And secondly, we set up this different, differentiated career path. And then we also change the evaluation. And also we provide well, innovation-based uh, income. And also, this one also provides autonomy for department or schools because we gave those resources directly to the schools. And step three, starting from 2013, we'll start, start to merge those two tracks together. Basically, that's a provide a platform for recruited overseas faculty and the local faculty the same stage. So that's uh, the talent uh, pyramid we set up in 2008. So by 2014, actually, our, we thought we are uh, about one year in advance than original planning. 
We also set up some pilot schools to go faster in this reform. And after 80 years, so this career path become very clear to everyone. Well, after eight years practice, we have some proven result. So firstly is the culture that values and rewards innovation has started to grow. So in the last eight years, we newly hired about 500 world-class scholars and 293 local faculty members was selected into the tenure system. And also the, the faculty members with the PhDs grows from 50% to 85%. And uh, well, the total budget was increased by three folders from 2.2 .2 billion to 8 billion. Uh, whereas research funding was also greatly increased by four folders from uh, 5.5 billion to 2.6 billion. And this experience was summarized as a nature article and also with Peter also in, in that picture. <laughs> and uh, some positive effects also can be seen because we, since 2007, after we introduced many first class uh, world renowned scholars, which has set up a very high standard so many local faculty members also grow very fast. So they gain international reputation. And also around about 100 faculty members uh, were se uh, selected as a fellow of international academic organizations. And the uh, whole of the university, the competitiveness was also greatly increased. So for example, the comprehensive strength of disciplines has improved considerably. And also the whole university gains much stronger innovation, innovation potential. So now in terms of the uh, NSFC grants, we are number one. So well, before the reform, we are number four, and now we are number one uh, in China. And also the taste of research was also greatly uh, changed because uh, for some period, Chinese people do not interest, well, Chinese researchers do not re re interested in any research which if takes about, well, more than five years to publish a paper and nobody wants to do that. But since this reform, since, for example, dark matter detection, which needs about 10 years hard work in very, very deep underground laboratory, so which is as deep as 2,500 meters deep. And uh, one of our university group uh, works there for in the last four years. And until now, they still did not publish any significant result. But uh, I mean, that changed the culture of the university, especially for students. Another example is the most, most well, the most, uh, well, the greatest challenge for Chinese people actually is not the energy, it's the clean water. Because uh, we almost polluted all of the clean waters in China. So therefore, uh, starting from 10 years ago, a group of our, well, our faculty teams went to Erhai, which is a very large lake. It's about 250 kilometers, square kilometers large lake. And they worked there in the last 10 years. Actually, they changed the culture of the local inhabitants. So after 10 years, that lake changed from, from class five to class, class two. So actually, as a matter of fact, that's the only successful example in China to well, make the lake clean. And now the central government wanted to copy this our experience to clean other lakes. So in, well, in 2008, we made our goals for 2020, which is those to build up the excellence in those three innovative systems. And we have some, well, sub, 
sub goals for those three systems. For example, we we need to to build this world class faculty with some detailed descrip uh, description, and also we have to be excellence in innovative capacity and so on. So hopefully by 2020, we are we are going to be a university, well, a first class university in the world with academic confidence and uh, advanced culture and, uh, uh, well, and uh, make a, a significant uh, contribution to the world and also uh, to the country. At the last, I would like to, well, to tell most of you what the meaning of our university name? Because many people confused by our name. Because when I was appointed as the president of Shanghai Jiu University, many people asked us, "Well, whether you are doing trains or you are doing bus or doing?" Because the literal name of our university is related to some something like traffic. <laughs> so actually, this word came from. The oldest Chinese philosophy book called Yi Jing, which is uh, written by 2,500 years ago. Jiao Tong means, uh, well, in Chinese, Tian Di Jiao er Wan Wu Tong, Shang Xia Jiao er Qi Zhi Tong. In English, is when heaven commun communicates well with the earth, everything grows. When the leadership communicates well with its people, the country grows. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Chan, for sharing uh, Shanghai Jiao Tong's strategy to recruit, mentor, and motivate quality faculty to place the university on a path towards innovation and excellence. Our next speaker is Professor Catherine Von Hill, President of Professor College. Professor Hill has served as President of the College since 2006. A renowned economist, Professor Hill is known for her work on the aff affordability of and access to higher education and her findings have been influential in expanding opportunities for students from all socioeconomic backgrounds to attend college in the US. Prior to joining Avassa, Professor Hill spent a stint at the World Bank and was provost of Williams College. Um, in 2011, she served in the governing board of Yale and US College, so one of us. So, President Hill, thank you. So welcome everybody and um, good afternoon and uh, this is a tough time slot. I know yesterday at this time I was actually sleeping, um, <laughs> but uh, I hope you'll stay with me. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to be here. Um, this is an incredibly exciting moment uh, in an even more exciting partnership. Uh, I feel uh, it, it's kind of fun for me to be here. Um, I am the graduate of a liberal arts college. I, I not only taught and then worked as provost at Williams College, but I also graduated from there in the 70s. And from there, I went to Oxford uh, <laughs> and <laughs> did uh, the, the politics and economics part of PPE. Um, and I recognized your description of these wonderful tutors, uh, particularly my economics tutor, who uh, I shared with David Cameron, not at the same time. Um, I have to say we came away with very different views of economics and that might have, <laughs> might have to do something with Jim Tobin at Yale, not so much the tutor at Oxford. Uh, I also have to mention that I had a very uh, distinguished politics tutor who, as far as I could tell, mostly was reading his mail while I was in his <laughs> office, but there's variance. Um, so what I want to do today is speak briefly about this topic that I've thought quite a bit about, uh, access and affordability in higher education. And I want to pay particular attention to how issues of access are incredibly important to and supports the liberal arts college mission in the United States, as well as around the world, which will tie it into the topic of this session. So um, I have a few not particularly important slides, but I'll move them along. Um, I'm assuming that because everybody's here, that we're all pretty much in agreement on the value and importance of the liberal arts. Uh, but even while we're here celebrating the opening of this amazing institution, 
uh, innovative liberal arts institution in Asia, it's kind of ironic that the liberal arts are being increasingly challenged by some, in fact, by many in the United States. Some of these challenges arise uh, from the fact that even in the United States, there's still really considerable confusion about what the term liberal arts actually means. Um, there's also a perception among many that it's frivolous uh, or that it does not prepare students adequately for life after college. Uh, even President Obama got into the act uh, and suggested that he was guilty of harboring this belief. Uh, he recently questioned the value of an academic major such as art history, which is very common at liberal arts colleges, although he later uh, both retracted this comment and apologized for it mm -hmm. after a social media onslaught, and many of the presidents around the room will understand what happened there. Um, uh, I want to start with the confusion about the liberal arts, and then I'll return to the value of a liberal arts education in a moment. Um, to start with, the term liberal, I think, is misleading. It really has nothing to do with being politically liberal, although it's actually not uncommon that campuses like Vassar College, where I am now as president, tend towards the political left, uh, both historically and currently. Uh, but in fact, we benefit from a diversity of political viewpoints. And this is related to this issue of access that I want to talk about. Because diversity of all kinds contributes to the mission of our institutions by bringing people with different points of view together to closely engage with each other. And I'll talk more about this in a minute. The other source of confusion about the liberal arts is the arts part, of course. The liberal arts is not just about the arts, which we've heard about today. In addition to the arts and humanities, the social sciences, the natural sciences, foreign language study, and combinations of disciplines are also incredibly important, in fact, core to a liberal arts education. To use Vassar as, a, as an example, um, the college is perhaps best known or most famously known for a strong tradition in the arts and humanities. Our, in, our alums include writers such as Edna St. Vincent Millay, Elizabeth Bishop, Mary McCarthy, and in the more modern era, actors such as Meryl Streep, uh, who we happen to share with Yale, where she went to do her graduate work. <laughs> Um, and Lisa Kudrow, for those of you who are more familiar with television and the web, AKA Phoebe from Friends. Um, but the, in fact, the college has had equal success in the natural sciences over its entire 150 years. Of four MacArthur Genius Award winners among our alums, all are in the sciences. And the founder of the college, Matthew Vassar, made it a top priority to recruit in the, of the original faculty to make Mariah Mitchell, uh, an astronomer already famous for her discoveries in the mid-19th century, was the first faculty member. Going back to those MacArthur Genius Award winners, I think a very interesting thing is, is almost all of their work, although in the natural sciences, was heavily interdisciplinary. And it's one of the, the benefits of a liberal arts institution. Lisa Kudrow was actually a biology major, uh, and she got distracted from med school by stand-up comedy at some point. So um, what are, one way to look at what we actually mean by the liberal arts is to look at the mission statements of liberal arts colleges. Uh, and I want to go, I want to scooch back one this one for a minute. Um, so I took a look at, a, at the mission statements of about 20 liberal arts schools that we compare ourselves to uh, when we want to do that. We have a comparison group that we use. Um, and a number of terms and phrases recurred throughout the set. Many mentioned the importance of diversity in some way and in a variety of forms. There was also frequent reference to community as being important to learning, implying that we learn not only by listening to instructors, by, but by engaging each other in discussion and debate. And among the goals for the students at these colleges, many made statements about developing leadership and altruism as desirable character traits, also commonly stated was the development of a desire and ability to continually educate oneself. Almost all schools avoided any statement about specific skills that graduates should have, except to emphasize mastery of communicating with <laughs> others and critically examining evidence. Um, this slide is just, I don't want you to read this, but just look at the blue stuff. Um, this is Vassar's mission statement. Um, and it's just a version of the liberal arts values, a thorough, well-proportioned, 
uh, liberal education. That actually was from a very early version of our mission statement. To lead a purposeful life, articulate expression, respectful debate, a broad and deep curriculum, a community diverse in background and experience. Uh, interestingly, in the United States, at least with our reaccrediting agency, every 10 years you have to revisit your mission statement. And the accrediting agency holds you responsible for actually meeting the things that you state in your mission statement. So 10 years ago, we actually rewrote about a two to three page mission statement for a much shorter one. And my goal for the next reaccreditation study is to get it as short as Yale and US's. <laughs> so uh, I want to talk briefly a little bit about the importance of diversity to the liberal arts mission, which was what I started out to do. Um, and that's because the purpose of access to a liberal arts education is in part diversity. Being accessible to talented students from all different backgrounds is important, not only because of commitments to notions of equal opportunity and the value to society of economic and social mobility, but because a diverse student body significantly adds to the quality of the interactions among students and students and faculty, as well as other members of the community who are important to a residential experience. Diversity can take many forms, including race, class, religion, veteran status, and nationality. With the world becoming increasingly integrated and so many of the problems that we face being global in nature, from the environment to public health to migration and refugees, having students from all over the world has become even more important to the missions of many liberal arts colleges. And many, including many in this room, I know, have long histories of admitting students from around the world. All of these forms of diversity are important because learning is greater when we confront difference. Diversity makes for classrooms and learning communities outside the classroom that are more fully, that more fully represent the plurality of the views that compromise our country, comprise our country and the world. When all students are alike, and have similar life experiences and share the same views, things tend to be a lot easier and more comfortable. In fact, life on campus would be a lot saner if that was the case. But when students are learning, uh, but then students are not learning the value of living, working, and having discourse with fellow community members that may disagree with those viewpoints. In a successful society, and improved relations among and across societies depends on the tolerance and respect and learning that comes from being exposed to a greater diversity of views. In addition, in one way or another, many of us in higher education believe that we're not just educating our students for their own benefit, and I'll talk about jobs and earnings in a minute, but so that they can make a difference in their communities and to our countries and to the world. And to do this, we need to be educating students, future leaders, from all different backgrounds and communities and countries. And our student, students need to learn how to navigate and embrace these differences, skills that are going to help them for the rest of their lives after graduation. So let me turn to jobs and earnings, at least briefly. Higher education leads to being qualified for higher paying jobs and also gives job seekers the flexibility of a better match with a job that matches up to your personal interests and therefore contributes to finding a rewarding career. A four-year college degree as opposed to just a secondary school education in the United States now increases lifetime earnings by about 65 percent, which given current um, wage levels amounts to more than about a million dollars over a lifetime. And since 1980 in the United States, the premium for having a BA has been increasing steadily. And in fact, that premium has doubled over this period since 1980. Uh, so getting a higher education degree is more important uh, than it's ever been. Uh, also, it's just not relative earnings. In fact, for men with just a high school degree, uh, their earnings have actually declined in real terms in the United States by about 20% over the last uh, 30 or so years. And in addition, the extent to which your economic chances depend increasingly on those of your parents in the United States, it's a four-year degree that significantly <coughs> increases intergenerational income mobility. Your chances of moving up from one income quintile, that of your parents to which you were born, to a higher one depends importantly on getting a higher education degree. 
So this is just some of the data on, on relative earnings. Now, I, I also want to mention a recent study that just came out um, reporting on uh, liberal arts earnings. And uh, it, it reports that liberal arts graduates, in some cases, earn less in their first jobs than others with degrees in specific skills like business or engineering, but that they actually go on to earn more later in their life. Uh, and I think the fact that specific job skills can and do become obsolete in today's economy suggests that another benefit of a liberal arts education, as we've been defining it, is this flexibility over time. Skills like criti critical reasoning, problem solving, and good writing don't, in fact, become obsolete. Uh, education is also better for the community and the country where these graduates live. In addition to contributing to their own economic welfare and e economic growth more generally, uh, it's also known that things like volunteering in the community and voting are correlated with having a college degree. In addition, I think a society where members feel that, that they have the opportunity to compete and succeed based on their hard work and merit has advantages over ones where some feel they're excluded and that the rules are not fair. So I want to take a minute and talk about the challenges to access that we're having in general in higher education in the United States, and maybe, maybe even especially at elite private liberal arts colleges and universities. Sadly, I think we're currently backsliding in America regarding enabling our young people to attain higher education degrees. 25 years ago, the US had a greater share of population with college degrees than any other country, and now we're not even in the top 10. According to the Department of Education, uh, we are now number 12. And it's not just that other countries are do, doing better than we are, because that would actually be fine. It's a good thing that other countries are increasing their educational attainment. But our educational attainment levels are, in fact, stagnating. Uh, and what's more troubling is that the groups that would benefit most from having a higher education degree are the least likely to attain one. And to compound this even further, these include the fastest growing demographic group in the United States, namely Hispanic students. One of the real strengths of the American higher education system is, is, is the incredible diversity of the types of institutions that we have, from low-cost two-year community colleges with open admissions, anybody can enroll, to highly selective and high-cost private, nonprofit four-year colleges and universities, including many of the liberal arts colleges. As the income gap between the very rich and the very poor continues to widen in the United States, uh, which it's been doing for the last four decades, one of the results is that whether or not you go on to higher education, and even more, whether or not you obtain a degree, depends on race and income level and not just on merit. And race and income and not just merit also affect which type of higher education institution you're likely to attend which in turn then affects the likelihood that you will graduate, which is the important thing, and then benefit from having done so. Um, and this has made establishing a truly diverse student body across all types of institutions very challenging in America. Just for a little bit of data, um, about 44% of uh, Whites go on and uh, have a higher education, achieve a higher education credential. Only about 28% of African Americans do, only 20% of Hispanics, and 23% of Native Americans. Asian Americans do the best at 59%. Uh, in addition to differing by race, the educational attainment rates differ by family income as well. About 83% of students from the top third of the income distribution go to college versus just a little over 50% in the bottom third. And at the very selective colleges and universities in the United States, including many liberal arts colleges, about 70% of their students come from the top 20% of the income distribution, meaning that only 30% come from the bottom 80%. So ideally, access to different types of higher educational institutions would depend more on the match of student skills and accomplishments, and not on their income, race, gender, veteran status, or other attributes unrelated to their talents. And in addition, to get educational attainment up in the United States, we're going to need to educate more of those groups who are currently not getting through college 
And this gets back to the access issue. So what do we do about, about uh, all of this? Just speculating on some possible ways to move forward. Um, One thing that would be great would, if, would be if we could just allocate more resources to this. This question came up this morning about scaling. Um, liberal arts colleges and wonderful research universities are very expensive. Uh, it would, we could certainly do more if we had more resources. Um, and these could come from the government, but I have to say that the outlook here is pretty uncertain at best in the United States right now. Alternatively, individual schools can reallocate resources uh, within their institutions to provide more opportunities for underrepresented groups. Uh, we've done this in the past, and many schools, including the schools in the room here today, liberal arts colleges and universities, are doing this, recognizing the value not just to society, but to the educational mission of their institutions. Uh, this generally means more resources devoted to need-based financial aid, uh, and this means making trade-offs elsewhere. The government in the United States uh, could possibly play a role in another way, and that's by providing incentives for colleges to recruit, admit, and support a broader spectrum of applicants, including those that are currently underrepresented. Um, I actually think that this was part of what the uh, Department of Higher Education's uh, ranking system was trying to do. Um, I think many in higher education were not particularly supportive of it. Uh, worrying about unintended consequences, which was probably not unwise to do, um, but we can come back and talk more about that. I think interestingly, with, with a, a, a presidential election coming up, all kinds of ideas related to higher education are being discussed by the candidates, but at least to date, I can't actually honestly say that these discussions are very reassuring about the future. Um, and lastly, I want to suggest that if our goal is to provide a high-quality education to more students, with a higher percentage of students nationally finishing their degree programs, then it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world to actually look for some solutions that reduce costs and don't just require scaling. Uh, and I think there's incredible potential here in the technology world. Um, I don't think we figured this out quite yet, um, but I think there are lots of talented people who are working on it, and I expect that we'll see a variety of innovations evolving over time and probably in the near future that will help us here. Um, I'm also completely confident that any such in innovations will not substitute for the learning that takes place at residential liberal arts colleges or <laughs> liberal education at research universities, uh, but will enhance it and may help make it an education that's available to more students. So finally, I'd like to just finish by saying how exciting it is to see a new and innovative liberal arts college take form, uh, one that is clearly committed to access and diversity across a great variety of dimensions. And I know that we're going to learn from this and have already learned from this, um, and it's an incredibly exciting journey. So thank you. Thank you, Professor Hill, for emphasizing the importance of accessibility and diversity the success of liberal arts education and for offering some possible solutions.